Hi, and welcome to the Fundamentals of Financial Management, a graduate finance course. Today we'll be going over Chapter 1. So in Chapter 1, we're going to be talking about different forms of business organizations, change in value for investors, creating value for investors, developing and maximizing shareholders' wealth, um, the stockholder-manager conflicts, stockholder debt holder conflicts and balancing interests of shareholders and society. So if we look at a typical financial organization and all business organizations are financial, even non for profit. If we look at a more of a public company, they will have a board of directors. The board of directors are elected through the shareholders. The board of directors will then hire a chief executive officer who will in turn hire a chief financial officer and a chief operational officer. The chief financial officer will be in charge of things like accounting, treasury, credit, legal, capital budgeting, and investor relations, some of which these topics we'll talk on quite extensively throughout this series of videos. Now, the chief operating officer that is going to deal with marketing, production, human resources, and operating departments. So let's look at some forms of business. There are three major forms of business. Partnerships, sole proprietorship, and corporation. There are some gray areas and some additional forms of business that fall in between these three, but these are the three big ones, the three high level classifications of different forms of business. Now let's look at proprietorships and partnerships. So the advantage of these are very easy to form. They're subject to very few regulations and there is no corporate income taxes. So that all sounds great, but the disadvantages are it's more difficult for these types of companies to raise capital. Primarily because we're dealing with a smaller businesses, businesses with maybe one principal or two principal owners that will have a limited source of raising funds, unlike a corporation that could issue stock, more easily issue, issue bonds and things of that nature. Disadvantages include also unlimited liability. So your biz, if you have a partnership or a proprietorship, and, and somebody sues your business, they can go after your personal assets. That's a real bummer. And a limited lifetime. So the limited life of these businesses are really limited to your life or one of the partner's lives, and then the business is over. So often uh, these types of companies can be set up through LLC, which is a little limited liability corporation, or an LLP, which is a limited liability partnership. So these are different forms of these two types of businesses to help limit the liabilities, uh, which is one of the main disadvantages of these two types of business. Now, a corporation uh, has advantages of unlimited life. So basically, when you create a corporation, you create an artificial person. So this artificial person can live forever. So the corporation is, has an unlimited life as long as it doesn't go bankrupt and out of business. Easy transfer of ownership because corporations have stock, you can easily transfer ownership from one person to another. Limited liability. When the corporation gets sued, the assets at stake here are only the corporate assets, not the owner's personal assets. Ease of raising capital. Uh, because corporations can more easily access the capital markets, including stocks and bonds, they can more easily raise the capital to grow the business. Some disadvantages, of course, are double taxation, which means the corporation gets taxed on their earnings, and then when they pass them through to investors, the investors also have to pay tax on those earnings. So how does a corporation pass through income? Well, if a corporation makes income, they first pay taxes. The remainder, they could choose to pay out as dividends to shareholders, and then the shareholders will have to pay tax on those dividends, hence the double taxation. And it's also much more expensive to set up, the cost of setup, and the cost of um, reporting and filing, especially if it's a public corporation. Corporations can be private, but public corporations have the most expenses as they have to deal with satisfying SEC regulations and additional paperwork uh, related to public shares of stock. 
So let's talk about stock prices and intrinsic value. So companies themselves, just by themselves, is they're generally hard to value the exact amount of money they're worth. But each company has an intrinsic value, and that's a value of what the company should be worth based on the intrinsic values of the company, their assets, their properties, their copyrights, their patents. Now, in equilibrium, the stock price would equal the true uh, intrinsic value. So think of the intrinsic value as the perfect price value of the corporation. And there, the problem with intrinsic value, there isn't really one correct formula to get to this number. So it's sort of a mystery what the exact intrinsic value is. But intrinsic value is a more longer term, long run concept where we're trying to value the business based on its future prospects. Now, investor, um, investors perceive the value of the company incorrectly sometimes, and that may lead to an imbalance in the stock price. So in the short run, the stock price could be vastly different from the intrinsic value of the company. But if this is what can make you a good stock trader, if you can look at a company objectively and say, yeah, this company is very valuable based on these assets and its growth trajectory, I'm gonna ignore some short term ups and downs or the stock's out of favor right now, knowing that the earnings and the growth will eventually have to push the stock price up. So if you could see that more clearly, you could be a very good stock trader. So ideally, managers should avoid actions that are going to reduce the intrinsic value of the corporation. Um, so these, you know, if these decisions, uh, if you make a decision that's going to increase the stock price but decrease intrinsic value, that's a bad decision. So the stock price, you know, in the short run is what a lot of managers are incentivized to increase. But they all should look at the long term, increasing long term intrinsic value of the company, which means making investments now that will pay off, hopefully both in the short and long term, but at least most importantly, in the long term. Determining intrinsic value in stock prices. So let's look at a few factors. here. So we have the managerial actions, the decisions the managers make, such as buying other companies, starting new product lines changes in advertising tactics, things that managers can do will affect the intrinsic value. Economic environment is if the economics are favorable or unfavorable to the business, taxes and political climate. So all these things So we saw when taxes change, we had a big change in taxes in um, 2018, and we see that corporate taxes went down, corporate values and stock prices went up. When the political cha climate changes from one of stricter regulations and stricter control on corporations to less regulations and less control on corporations, that could increase uh, value, uh, intrinsic value and stock prices of companies. So for example, if the regulations are removed on many taxing and expensive regulations are removed on the oil industry, uh, and the access to uh, look for additional oil in, say, federal lands, that can increase the value of those companies. If the political climate changes, such as Canada, and they legalize marijuana, that could change the intrinsic and stock prices of marijuana-based companies. So this could boil down to uh, investor cash flow, so true investor cash flow. So if these decisions increase cash flows, that increases the value of the business. Um, when we look at risk, if these decisions increase risk, that's going to decrease the values. If they're going to reduce risk, that's going to increase the values. So if a manager makes a decision to uh, have a more diversified customer base rather than relying on one customer or two customers, that would reduce risk, increase values. Uh, perceived investor cash flows. So there is, well, let me tell you the difference between um, true and perceived. So we have uh, true investor cash flows and true risk. So this is the act, most accurate, realistic um, risk and cash flows. That's going to be uh, really going to value more so on the intrinsic value company side. But perceived how investors perceive the future cash flows and perceive the risk 
whether or not it's true or inaccurate is going to set the stock price. So if investors incorrectly perceive the cash flows or incorrectly perceive the risks, the stock may be trading below uh, intrinsic value, which we would say trading at a discount. Okay, so when we look at the true cash flows and the true risk, that will bring us to the stock's intrinsic value, the, the true value of the company. And if we look at perceived cash flow and perceived risk, that's going to equal the stock market price. And oftentimes, if we have a market equilibrium, the intrinsic value will equal the stock price. But that's a rarity. That does not occur too often. Usually there's a misalignment. And when the stock price is greatly below the intrinsic value of a company, that would be the time to invest. Now, sometimes there could be conflicts between stockholders and managers. So managers are inclined to act in their own best interest because they're only human, which are not always the same interest as the stockholders. So what are some things that can affect the managerial behavior or the choices they make? Well, one is definitely the managerial compensation packages. So if management is very interested in um, you know, they're increasing their compensation and the compensation is based on stock price, short-term stock price, they may take actions or do things that will improve stock price in the short term, such as stock buybacks, such as, you know, um, front loading, uh, uh, speeding up sales into the current quarter, uh, anything they could do to make the current quarter revenues and profits look better to increase the stock price, increase their compensation. Um, you know, direct intervention by shareholders. Shareholders can rise up and question and demand management to change. So this is going to affect the manager's behavior if they see that the shareholders may be led by an activist shareholder is demanding certain changes at the company. And of course, if the manager is under threat of being fired, if they're closely being monitored or watched for any inappropriate actions, this may change their behavior drastically. And also if there's a threat of a takeover. So if a business is going to be taken over, managers may make changes or, or decisions to help to make the takeover um, less, uh, less of a possibility. Why? Because usually managers are the first to be fired once their company is taken over. So man managerial uh, behavior, you know, sometimes it can be selfish. Sometimes they may um, not hire the best person. They might hire a relative. Sometimes they may um, commit fraud or steal company property or waste company time. Uh, so there, you know, these are called agency issues when the managers don't act in the best uh, behavior accustomed to what they should be doing for the company. Now, if you look at stockholder and bondholder conflicts, so stock, uh, when a company wants to raise money, they can raise money through issuing stock. Now, they can also raise money through issuing bonds. So the stockholders are more likely to prefer riskier projects that they're going to perceive a bigger upside if the project succeeds, where bondholders, in, in contrast, don't want to risk the fixed payments that they're going to receive, so they would want to limit risk. So bondholders don't really share much of the upside of the company. So bondholders would rather the company be safe and stable to ensure their stream of dividends and where stockholders would want the company to be a little bit more aggressive in growth. Uh, so bondholders are not too concerned about the use of additional debt by the company, but bondholders can protect themselves by including covenants in their bond agreements that limit the use of additional debt or constrain certain managers' actions. And these, these types of things we'll talk about uh, more in the bond valuation uh, chapter area of this book. Okay, balancing shareholder interests and society interests. So what are the shareholders' interests? Well, the financial manager is basically there to maximize shareholder wealth. And the shareholders' interest is in that the stock price goes up so they make money. So that primary financial goal of management to maximize the wealth, the shareholders' wealth, they want that to translate into stock price. So because any, as we'll see in this, in this series, any asset... Um, is really the, 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 the surmised value of the present value of its cash flows. So the amount of money the asset will generate in cash flows. 
So decisions need to be made that are going to maximize finances um, and we have to look at the financial consequences that each decision could have, such as the decision to pay, pay all employees $15 an hour. So stock prices will change as conditions change, as investors obtain new information about the company. Um, now managers recognize that for the company to be have a better prospects long term, they need to be socially responsible. Uh, and they, they need to be, uh, and this is not inconsistent with maximizing shareholders' wealth because if you do what's right and you take the right precautions and you follow the guidelines, your company will be less open to lawsuits, your company will be um, less subject to fines or, or, uh, by not following proper regulations, you'll develop more goodwill from customers, uh, and your company will have a better reputation. So managers need to balance and make sure that their interest in maximizing wealth also coincides with their interest of being socially responsible to not just the planet, to the, the employees, to the shareholders, to the citizens and their customers. Everybody needs to be, all these stakeholders need to be considered when enhancing the company's profits. Okay, so that's a quick overview of chapter one. And I look forward to you listening to my chapter two review. Thank you.